If we are going to talk about artists and political art, the art of political dissent, Ai Weiwei should definitely come to mind. Ai Weiwei is the most famous Chinese artist living today. As an activist, he calls attention to human rights violations on an epic scale. As an artist, he expands the definition of art to include new forms of social engagement. In a country where free speech is not recognized as a right, the police have beaten him up, given him, kept him under house arrest, bulldozed his newly built studio, and subjected him to surveillance. He is viewed ultimately as a threat to the harmonious society. The West did not invent revolutionaries. China has an illustrious history of dissidents anti-authoritarian originals and eccentrics, from the drunken monks of prehistory to counterculture artists living in today's Beijing. One of the most famous artistic traditions, anti-authoritarian artistic traditions, is of course the literati movement, which we see here in one of these pieces, in this piece. And the literati movement is typically Chinese in it people who had the ability to work for the court, people who would have had a comfortable living in civil service, would drop out of that society to focus on things like calligraphy, philosophy, poetry, and art, creating a pure form and removing themselves from the power structures of China itself. Kind of dropping out in protest of what they saw as a corrupt system that just didn't work for their lives. Ai Weiwei himself is from a long line of free thinkers, his father, of course, being famously persecuted during the Cultural Revolution. And these free thinkers were marginalized both by the right and the left. From smashing an ancient vase to reciting the names of children who died due to government negligence, Ai Weiwei's dramatic actions highlight the widening gap between the ideal and the real in Chinese society. And he's always playing with the rules. He's always pushing the rules. Here we see him mimicking in his pose, the pose of a Syrian toddler who had washed up on a beach dead, very famous image from a couple of years ago. And here he's mimicking that, not in a satirical way, but to call our attention to what happened there on a beach in the Eastern Mediterranean. So when we look at his work, there are a few questions we have to ask. First, is Ai Weiwei's work visual art, performance art, or theater? And honestly, in the back of your head, when you're thinking of that question, you also have to question, does it matter what category it fits in? Secondly, is Ai Weiwei's work art or is it political spectacle? Is this something else? Is this something that goes beyond art and visual forms to politics? Finally, why is art such a powerful medium for political dissent? After all, we see it all the time. We saw it a little bit with Banksy. We see it with other artists such as Gericault and Delacroix, and we see it here again with Ai Weiwei. My goal here is to look at the art of political dissent by a non-Western artist addressing issues in both China and the West. Who is Ai Weiwei? I came of age as an art student in 1990s New York. A time and place where the more outrageous, anti-authoritarian, and oppositional the statement, the better. He then returned to China, an environment known as being far less open to such views. In Ai's words, China and the U.S. are two societies with very different attitudes towards opinion and criticism. He saw the difference and refused to conform. He's an artist who actually put his life on the line to defend freedom of expression. 
Now, at one time, Iwaiwi was a professional blackjack player. His work is about risk, the same risk they would have taken as the professional blackjack player. A risk which is personal, professional, and political. It is also about testing the limits of freedom. His work is designed to remind us that risk-taking is an essential form of exercise in a free society. What is the point of having freedom of speech if you're not going to use it? Why worry about the First Amendment if you're not out there saying something? If you're not actually going to make use of the rights that you have? And I weigh away being from a society where that right doesn't exist is really in a position to call our attention to that issue, to this matter of freedom of speech. Government spying, a hot topic in contemporary art lately, is not some futuristic idea, but is a fact of life for the artist. Under government surveillance, for almost a decade, he's produced some of the most thoughtful work on the contemporary topic that is just as important in current popular culture as the hippies were in the 1960s and feminist art in the 1970s. This makes him a particularly dangerous artist. And that can be problematic at times. It can be difficult to deal with. It is highly contextual because something that is dangerous today may not be dangerous tomorrow. There was a time when women would have been beaten for attempting to vote or killed for going to the Olympic Games in ancient Greece. Today, we would see the same thing and say, well, it's not that dangerous. So whenever we deal with danger in art, it's always contextual. It's always contextual to the moment in which it is created. So keep that in the back of your mind. All art is political in the sense that all art takes place in the public arena and engages with an already existing ideology. Yet there are times when art becomes dangerously political for both the artist and the viewer who engages with that art. The problem is sometimes the viewer will be, well, corrupted or infected with an idea, an issue of class, an issue of race, an issue of gender. And that can be particularly dangerous. Again, not just for the artist. Think of Jacques-Louis David and his involvement in the French Revolution, his individual investment in art following the bloodshed and his imprisonment during the Reign of Terror. If it were not for certain sympathizers, David may well have ended up another victim of the guillotine. And what was particularly dangerous for him at the time, at the end of the 18th century, early 19th century, of course, today we might look at and go, wow, that's kind of quaint. Again, that issue of historical context. We need to think of things in the context in which they were created. In the case of David, the French Revolution, and in the case of Ai Weiwei, the early tw late 20th and early 21st century. There are other examples, such as Goya, who's an example of an artist who fell foul of governmental power. And there are instances in the 20th century when artists have faced down political power directly. Consider, for example, the photo montages of John Hartfield. Hartfield risked his life to produce covers for the magazine AZ, which defied both Hitler and the Nazi party. This is the political tradition which Ai Weiwei is trying to place himself into. And he's going to do so with pieces like dropping a Han Dynasty urn. Dropping a Han Dynasty urn is an early work by the artist and demonstrates his show-stopping conceptual brilliance and desire to provoke controversy. Outside his mother's home in Beijing, he drops and smashes a 2,000-year-old ceremonial urn. Not only did the artifact have considerable value, 
In this case, the artist paid the equivalent of several thousand dollars for it. But it has symbolic and cultural worth. The Han Dynasty is considered a defining moment in Chinese civilization. Understandably, antique dealers were outraged, calling Ai Weiwei's work an act of desecration. He countered by saying, quote, General Mao used to tell us that we can only build a new world if we destroy the old one. This is a provocative act of cultural destruction in reference to the erasure of cultural memory in communist China, an anti-elite society that carefully monitored access to information, even today it carefully monitors access to information, especially about its dynastic history. This piece is literal iconoclasm and spotlights hypocrisy. This smashed vase embodies the central message Ai Weiwei would continue to explore, this idea that by destroying this Han Dynasty vase, he is destroying the culture the same way that Mao would destroy the culture in the 1960s during the Cultural Revolution. And yet, he brings to light the hypocrisy of everyone rising up saying, don't destroy that, don't destroy that piece of the past, and showing this cognitive dissonance that people hold both sides. Is he destroying a piece of the past that is almost sacred? Or is he doing exactly what he's been told to do by Chairman Mao and some of his upbringing? Well, which one is it? And these sorts of elements of cognitive dissonance are exactly what he wants to draw light to. He wants you to take a side. Is this artistic expression by destroying a Han Dynasty vase? Or is this something worse? Is this somehow sacrilege in that he's destroying a cultural artifact of perhaps unknown history and incredible value. Well, we won't know. It's destroyed. But you have to take a side. Study of Perspective Tiananmen Square is what at first appears to be a classic tourist snapshot, with Ai sticking his middle finger up at the Tiananmen Square gate, also known as the Gate of of heavenly peace and formerly the front entrance to the Forbidden City. This was also the site of the brutal massacre in 1989 in which state soldiers shot and ran over peaceful protesters. The Beijing government still refuses to discuss it and censors all footage of the event. This image Study of Perspective, Tiananmen Square, was part of a larger series begun in 1995 and completed in 2003. The Eiffel Tower in Paris, the Reichstag in Berlin, and the White House in Washington, D.C. all get the same treatment in these parodies of Renaissance perspective. The central rule that objects closer to the eye must appear larger is being used to showcase the offensive gesture expressing Ai's basic disdain for state power, which is by no means limited to China. And here, it's juxtapositioned, or I've juxtapositioned it, with this classic Renaissance example of forced perspective, where we're meant to focus on those things in the foreground. In this case, an image of Jesus and Peter, similar to Ai Weiwei's work, where we're meant to focus on the finger, and then we are drawn back to look at what his finger is facing or what's in the background. We're invited back, the finger kind of drawing us there. Now, when Ai Weiwei was arrested and interrogated by Chinese police in 2011, his interviewers limited their questions to this particular photograph demanding an explanation of all the pieces he did. This is the one they talk about. Ai Weiwei stated that he had meant to target feudalism, explaining that the gate had been built by a Ming emperor, which is true. While his interrogators could not acknowledge it, 
they were no doubt aware of another level of visual symbolism. This one small finger that seems giant and imposing in front of the Forbidden City is reminiscent in its resemblance to the Tank Man. An unidentified protester photographed in 1989 facing a line of tanks. Ai Weiwei's finger standing alone against symbols of state power at the center of this image is a provocative stand-in for the figure strictly banned in Chinese media and therefore truly and brilliantly provocative. Now remember, he's trying to be provocative here. He's trying to get you to think about the larger political context. That one little element, that finger, which we know in reality is quite small and easily broken or damaged, here stands before this incredible symbol of power, the Forbidden City. Just as the tank man, small and insignificant, easily run over and flush down a street grate, stands before the power of the Chinese military during the Tiananmen Square standoff in front of these tanks, stopping them. And by the way, no harm comes to him. He continues on. But that's not where Ai Weiwei stops. He continues on and creates straight, 2008 to 12. Straight is both a stylized representation of an earthquake and an image of its effects. It's a statement about a specific instance of governmental corruption and negligence. The province of Shejuan suffered massive casualties in earthquake of 2008, leaving over 90,000 people dead or missing. Over 5,000 of these people were children killed when poorly constructed schools collapsed on top of them. Ai Weiwei, who's a self-taught architect, was outraged to discover that this could have easily been avoided. So he creates straight, which is both a memorial and a call to action. Straight is part of the artist's broader effort to hold the Chinese government responsible and urge it to take preventative steps to avoid future disaster. It would take Ai Weiwei four years to complete this monumental floor sculpture, almost 40 feet long and 20 feet wide. Here we're seeing part of it and weighing some 200 tons to construct it. He collected the bent and broken steel reinforcement bars that were part of the badly built schools. And then he commissions metal workers to straighten and mend them until they look as if they could have been whole before the earthquake. So he's not doing the work. He's not physically out there recovering these reinforcing bars. He's not the one who's going to straighten them. He is, however, coming up with the idea, which is why he's credited for the work. He then arranges the bars in waves that resemble the oscillation in an earthquake on a seismograph. And we've all seen those oscillations, those lines on a seismograph that show an earthquake happening. The fissures and lines between them represent the fault line. So here as we look at it, these lines that happen between the various rows of rebar both look like they're uh, seismic lines, but also appear to be fissures or faults in the earth the very thing that causes the earthquake in the first place. The thousands of individual components reference the individual lives lost. And this is a typical feature of Ai Weiwei's symbolism. After all, he comes from a very populous country, a country where it's very difficult to stand out when you have so many people around you. Now, the Chinese government did not appreciate the attention the artist drew to this national embarrassment. And this marked the beginning of an especially turbulent period in his adversarial relationship 
with Chinese authorities. After all, imagine you're in charge of an authoritarian state. The last thing you want people to know is, hey, by the way, a lot of these people died because of shoddy construction, because of poor craftsmanship. And yet that's exactly what happened. And while these things happen all the time, and we know that they happen all the time, we don't usually have it called to our attention in quite the same way that Ai Weiwei is. And if these were steel bars from a skyscraper that fell down, it wouldn't even be as powerful. But we are told and we know that these are from schools. And these represent the lives lost, as well as the possibilities that are lost. One of those children could have cured cancer, could have had immense impact on the world, but can't anymore because of the workmanship that led to their schools collapsing and killing so many of them. So it becomes a powerful statement in a number of different ways, and yet it's still a statement on freedom of speech. Ai Weiwei is pushing that boundary. He knows he's pushing that boundary with the Chinese government, and yet he still does it, trying to show that freedom of speech is a human right and one that he is going to take every advantage of, no matter what the consequence. Arguably, the piece that brought Ai Weiwei to world prominence would be Sunflower Seeds of 2010. Ai Weiwei often uses his art to critique political and economic injustice. This can be seen in works such as his 2010 installation, Sunflower Seeds, at Tate Modern London. This piece consists of more than 100 million tiny, handmade porcelain sunflower seeds, originally weighing in at over 150 tons. There were enough of them, in fact, to fill the enormous turbine hall at Tate Modern an industrial building turned contemporary art space. Sunflower Seeds evokes a warm personal memory for the artist, who recalls that while he was growing up, even the poorest in China would share sunflower seeds as a treat. And this would be a common element, something that was shared among fr friends, something that brought people together. The use of sunflower seeds as the basis of his installation was also designed to subvert popular imagery rooted in the artist's childhood. Communist propaganda optimistically depicted leader Mao Zedong as the sun and the citizens of the People's Republic of China as sunflowers, turning towards their chairman. Ai Weiwei reasserts the sunflower seeds as a symbol of camaraderie. Though each of the 100 million seeds is carefully crafted, they also draw the viewer's attention once arranged together in a neat rectangle or covering the floor of an entire room with these hyper-realistic seeds, creating a sense of vastness. So here's the thing. Each individual seed is carefully crafted to the point where it becomes an exhibition in and of itself. We could display the individual seeds, but to see them in numbers like this has a whole nother power. I mean, think about it. How many times have you heard numbers in history? So-and-so killed 6 million people, 10 million people. There were 100 million people who died of epidemic here. And yet, it's hard to visualize those numbers. It's hard to think about that as more than a number. I mean, sure, one or ten or a hundred, we can think of that. We can see that in our head. We can look at a crowded college classroom and say, yeah, okay, there's maybe 30 people in here. We know those numbers. But here, he's taken a number that tends to be so abstract that we can't really grasp it in our head. And he's made it real and visual. A hundred million sunflower seeds laid out cleanly on the floor here. And in this installation, there's a sense of precision in the arrangement of the seeds, creating visual order, creating 
uniformity. No single seed stands out. The individual is lost among the millions. And this, in and of itself, is a critique of conformity and censorship inherent in modern China. Now, in its creation, we see more than 1,600 artisans working to make the individual porcelain seeds by hand in China, in an area known as the porcelain capital of the world, where artists have been producing pottery for nearly 2,000 years. Porcelain, this symbol of imperial culture in China, was also made for export via the Silk Road and became an important element in the creation of the idea of China in the West. After all, we still call porcelain ware China frequently for just this reason, because it's so connected to China historically. Ai Weiwei's use of porcelain comments on the long history of this prized material while also rejecting the common and negative connotation of the modern term, made in China. After all, these seeds are made in China, but they're handmade individually with incredible precision. And so he's kind of making us wonder about that. And remember his perspective. He's from China. He's going to see this idea of made in China being cheap or relevant as offensive as maybe speaking personally to him, to his life's experience. Utilizing skilled artisans known for their exquisite craftsmanship to make objects that can only be differentiated one from another upon close inspection alludes to the important porcelain tradition in China, as well as to the uniformity and diffusion of modern, or cheap and fast, labor that is responsible for China's hard-won place in the world economy. Sunflower Seeds asks us to examine how our consumption of foreign-made goods affects the lives of others across the globe. The artwork, therefore, was a clever pretext for calling attention to a politically sensitive issue, actually a few of them, to the issue of standing out in a society that is so based on conforming. He's also dealing with that idea of China as the industrial center of the world. Is it really a good thing that China manufactures all of these items cheaper than anyone else? Or does it in fact have a major impact on China? He's also looking at China as a whole, trying to get us to see it both as a whole, the hundred million in this case, but also as an individual, because imagine you're in the Tate Modern at the time. One of the things you're going to want to do is focus on one or two of those seeds. Look at what goes into it. These levels of nuance are always there with Ai Weiwei. And here again, he's using symbolism, in this case, the sunflower seeds, so key to Chairman Mao to get across ideas of freedom of speech, ideas of individuality, ideas that are in many ways antithetical to modern day China as he understands it. Surveillance camera is a very personal piece for Ai Weiwei. It speaks to a very specific time in his life and a specific series of events that he goes through. Now, in 2010, the Beijing police installed security cameras inside his home and his studio, as well as around the properties. These were meant to track him from room to room or even outside. They also will closely monitor his posts on Twitter and Instagram. As the artist put it, quote, in China, I am constantly under surveillance. Even my slightest, most innocuous move can and often is censored by Chinese authorities. The artist, in turn, tracks the surveillance cameras, vans, and plain-clothed police officers that monitor his gates. Surveillance camera, an austere and quite beautiful marble sculpture, 
reminds us that the artist is watching those who watch him. Like tea or porcelain, his choice of medium here is significant. In this case, a surveillance camera in marble, literally set in stone, reminds us of the omnipotence of this feature in Ai Weiwei's life, as well as its role as a stand-in for an authority like the statue of a Roman emperor. Now, I should point out, Ai Weiwei doesn't actually create these pieces. He's not suddenly learning to sculpt in marble, but he's coming up with the idea and commissioning it, much like straight, much like the sunflower seeds. This doesn't make him any less of an artist, but in light of artists like Marcel Duchamp and Fountain, he's taking on the role as artist, as philosopher. So he comes up with the ideas. He's trying to get a message across. He's coming up with the message and then coming up with the medium, which is exactly what we see here with surveillance camera. And the use of marble is powerful because marble is something that we would expect to last the ages. We would expect it to be an element of permanence. Just like the Greek and Roman statues that have been dug up since, well, ancient times. These pieces will be buried for 2,000 years and yet found whole. This piece could last much longer than China, the United States, or any number of elements in this world. And yet, we get this sense of permanence. This sense that the state gets to decide and the camera, this unmoving, unfeeling cold. I mean, think about marble, cold to the touch, the camera, this cold element that merely observes us is playing such a role in his life. Set on a plinth at eye level, which is the correct way to display this piece. And by the way, you'll notice that this piece looks a little different than the last slide. That's because there are multiple copies of surveillance camera. But set on a plinth at eye level, the resemblance of the shape to a head and shoulders is a visual twist characteristic of Ai Weiwei's broader sense of humor about the absurdity of his situation. After all, he's tracking people tracking him. These people are surveilling him. They're watching him because they don't agree with what he's doing. And yet, if they just looked away, then they wouldn't have to look at what he's doing. Now, it kind of goes even further, beyond simply the piece of art. In 2012, he set up Weiwei Cam, broadcasting a live feed and inviting his followers to view him at work and going about his business, mimicking the intrusion of Chinese officials into his private life. But here, the viewers are watching him at his invitation. Authorities quickly shut it down within two days. But it remains a testament to his persistent wit and unwavering commitment to holding his government publicly responsible for its intrusions into the lives of his citizens. Remember, he's not just commenting about how the Chinese government is dealing with him as a specific individual, but all of the practices that we're seeing coming out of China, things like social credit, the idea that somehow the Chinese government can track the reputation of its citizens and determine how those people should be treated moving forward. If your social credit actually drops far enough, you can't fly, you can't travel, you lose a lot of freedom. So it's sort of like if your parents ever had a point system, at the end of the week, you either got a reward or a punishment. That's kind of what's going on here and what he's reacting against this constant surveillance that is pervasive in China at the time. Now, of course, you knew I was going to have to get to an arrest at some point. And this picture is not his actual arrest. Uh, this is a model, but we have images from plays as well that get into this situation. So in 2011, Ai Weiwei will be arrested in China following a crackdown by the government on so-called political dissonance. As an aside, this is a specific category. 
that the Chinese government used to classify those who seek to subvert state power. So he will be called a political dissonance, dissonant for alleging economic crimes against the Chinese state. Sorry, for alleged economic crimes against the Chinese state. Now, economic crimes is an incredibly broad term. Basically, it could be a, as much as tax evasion. It could be a number of things. In this case, it's a pretense to hold him because they want him to stop. They want him to stop making statements about China. Ai Weiwei will, sorry, has used his art to address both the corruption of the Chinese Communist government and its outright negligence when it comes to human rights, particularly in the realm of freedom of speech and freedom of thought. So his arrest almost becomes a piece of art. Suddenly, Ai Weiwei, who's talking about freedom of speech, who's really challenging the Chinese government to do something, gets them to do it, and then the Chinese government realizes they've kind of walked into this. He's become stronger because they arrested him. And these situations happen all the time. The Germans, for example, watched but never touched Pablo Picasso, who is incredibly anti-Nazi and anti-war, living in Paris under German occupation during World War II. They wouldn't touch him because he was too famous and well-known, and had they done so, they might have made him more powerful. It's exactly the trap that the Chinese walk into. Now, whether Ai Weiwei intended that or not is a whole different ballgame. But this arrest means that Ai Weiwei was getting through, means that the Chinese government did, in fact, see him as a threat. And that gives him credibility and gives him more power moving forward. Law of the Journey is one of a number of immigration-based images that we see coming from Ai Weiwei. So in 2017, with his new exhibition, Law of the Journey, Ai Weiwei continues to explore the enormity of the refugee humanitarian crisis. A refugee himself, Ai Weiwei has dedicated the last two years of his career to creating politically charged artwork that speaks to the issue. Quote, There's no refugee crisis, but only a human crisis. In dealing with refugees, we've lost our very basic values, states the Chinese artist, one of the most powerful figures in contemporary art. Hosted at the Trade Fair Palace by the National Gallery of Prague, his work is a multi-layer epic statement on the human condition. The location itself is a powerful reminder of how history repeats itself. Built in 1928, the Trade Fair Palace was an assembly point for Jews prior to their deportation to Terezin concentration camp. Here, under the weight of its past, the hall is a vessel for Ai Weiwei's new epic installation. We see an immense, overcrowded rubber boat filled with bodies unfurling across space. The boat is suspended from the ceiling, much as the fate of its passengers hangs in the balance. Stuck in limbo without knowledge of what is to come, they huddle together as they move toward this new future. Tellingly, bodies are littered around the boat. Fallen soldiers during the arduous crossing, some of whom have already passed. Others who will reach out for safety. They are a reminder of just how perilous these journeys can be. What is he getting at? He's getting at the same migrant crisis that we discussed with Banksy's jungle in Calais in 2015. He's talking about the migrant crisis primarily in Europe, where we have immigrants from, or migrants from Syria and the Middle East crowding into Europe, 
frequently taking dangerous boat voyages across the Eastern Mediterranean, sometimes from North Africa across the Mediterranean, and not knowing what's going to happen. Frequently, you have hundreds of people in a boat meant for 50. Frequently, you have unscrupulous captains who will jump ship. You have sort of mercenaries out there who are willing to ram these boats and sink them rather than allow the migrants to get to shore. And these migrants have no control. Once they're on the boat, they're really under nature's control. There's no way that they can really have a sense of agency. They have no way of controlling their fate. They have to simply roll with the punches, as it were. And what he's doing is he's reminding us that these are human beings. That this isn't about people coming in and taking benefits or living off of social welfare systems. This is about human beings who can't live in the place that they were because of war or famine or any number of other things who have to move. And they're simply looking for help. Ai Weiwei is arguing, look, look at these people. Look at the scale of the crisis. We need to be willing to help these people, even if it means giving up a little bit of what is ours. After all, that's what humans should do for one another. That's how we help each other. And with this issue of the immigrant crisis, European immigrant crisis. You could read this as an American immigrant crisis. And these crises change from place to place and year to year. There was a time in the 90s where it was Cubans coming to the United States. There have been times where it was different groups going to different places. But ultimately, he's also getting at that idea of free speech once again. And he's doing it in a way that speaks to everyone. This isn't specific to Calais. This isn't specific to Europe. This piece could be anyone. It could be any number of different groups or different migrations. It is universal. You could imagine yourself in this situation. Maybe during a time of war, maybe during a time of pandemic or whatever else, people run and they leave and they're looking for someone to help and Ai Weiwei is showing that as a humanitarian thing, as something that actually does happen. It's not just those people over there. It's not just numbers. He's trying to give us a sense of the reality of the situation by creating so many people. It's just like the sunflower seeds. Look at the scale of the crisis. And he wants us to start looking closer at the crisis. Because it's quite possible that you look around and you notice that a classmate or a neighbor or a friend could well be one of these migrants. And maybe that would change how you think about it. Tying things up, I want to remind you of the questions that we dealt with at the beginning. And I want to address each one. Is Ai Weiwei's work visual art, performance art, or theater? And you would think that this question is one of semantics, one of irrelevance. I mean, who cares if it's visual art, performance art, or theater? But ultimately, we kind of do. We love to categorize things as art historians and as humans. And really, Ai Weiwei crosses these lines in a very Duchampian way. He comes up with the message that he wants to get across, and then he determines what medium he's going to use to create it. This is artist as philosopher. And so we see pieces like Straight, where originally we would see Ai Weiwei depicting or taking these bars and the act of collecting the bars or having someone collect them for him and the act of straightening them arguably is performance art or theater. What we get when we get to the gallery, the final piece, the straightened bars, that is very much visual art. The same with dropping the Han Dynasty vase. As he's dropping it, it's arguably either performance art or theater, depending on your very specific definition. But the finished product on the gallery wall is visual art. 
So many times with Ai Weiwei, while he's crossing these bounds, there's always some element, some preserved element that will live on usually in the form of visual art, which is why he, he comes in under visual arts. Is Ai Weiwei's work really visual art? Or is it political spectacle? And does it matter? Well, again, it's kind of crossing those lines. So he's looking back at an earlier tradition. He's looking back at the realists, which you see an example of on the left. And the realists believed that the artist should function as social consciousness, depicting what they see and only what they see, and using that to improve the world. In this case, in the upper left, a massacre committed by the French during one of the Parisian revolts. And we see men, women, and children killed. On the right, Ai Weiwei is doing much the same. He's using his power as an artist to act as social consciousness. He's both acting as a visual artist, giving us a beautiful piece of sculpture, but also he's giving us a political statement much like the realists. What he's doing is not that unusual. The combination and the way that he's doing it, the directness with which he's doing it, is different, but it's not historically unusual. And does it matter? Yes. Yes, it does. Now, it can be both. He can be visual art and political spectacle at the same time, but it does matter. Because on one side, he's a protester. On the other side, he's an artist. Now, how many protesters do you remember? By name. There aren't too many. We do, however, remember artists, writers, philosophers, thinkers, intellectuals. And he's trying to put himself in that camp. He wants to be understood as a visual artist. The political spectacle is part of his message. But it's not all of who he is. He's an artist as well. One of his famous quotes, everything is art. Everything is politics. It's all kind of the same to him. Art plays in politics. Politics plays in art. We see propaganda going both ways. It's really, really common. In today's day and age, we don't have the same delineations that we may have had in the past, where an artist can stay out of those realms. It really doesn't happen today. Finally, why is art such a powerful medium for political dissent? Well, this is kind of a tricky situation, and at the same time, it's particularly simple. It's tricky because every art is different. So, for example, if you look at Banksy and others, they create very powerful visual images. And the power of visual images for anyone is that it can get a message across rapidly. An image like this, we can immediately tell what's going on. If I tell you that this is an image coming out of the Arab Spring, you know immediately what's going on. You can identify it as the seeds of revolution being planted. You know what's happening. It takes five seconds. And this is the power of art for political dissent. It can get a very complicated message out there very, very rapidly. So we can deal with deep and difficult questions in a matter of seconds. And sometimes that's the key to politics. Think about it. In politics, it's not about the long statement that someone makes. It's about the five second sound bite that they make. And a lot of this art is doing the same thing. Ai Weiwei does the same thing. He creates something that is visually fairly simple, or oftentimes visually fairly simple to understand, he's creating the visual equivalent of a soundbite, very similar to Banksy, but with a much more political bent, usually. This is the power of Ai Weiwei, not just his power of giving us a political view, but also his power of making us question the rights that we have and how we use them. For example, pointing out that 
If you have freedom of speech, why don't you use it? What's the point in having it if you never make use of it? He's calling out cognitive dissonance that exists in the world. He's calling out not only issues within China, but issues throughout the world from surveillance to individuality to liability and negligence. It's what makes Ai Weiwei such a powerful artist.